So why are we here and uh, what are we trying to accomplish? We come here to get to know one another, to exchange ideas, um, to go home with probably a list of about eight to 10 pages of action steps of things you can do to create a better sales organization. And we are, I would say, in the most confusing time that we have ever faced in the last decade. And uh, a lot of people are sad about the election. Some people are glad about the election. And uh, I think the best comment I've heard was from Dave Chappelle. <laughs> and he said on Saturday Night Live that we, the people, have given Donald Trump a chance to do good. And we hope that he'll give us the same chance. So life goes on. Um, and what the, the reason I start with this is to share a little bit about the zeitgeist of our times. And the zeitgeist is a German word that is the spirit of our times. That's sort of the background. But the background is not just a slice of the pie of politics. The background, the real background, is like two poles around which the world revolves. And the two pole, one pole is technology. And the second pole is human psychology. And what I'm seeing is, I want to, sh I want to share with you, is sort of a rough outline on how I think the world is going to work over the next three to five years. And the changes that I see is that we're moving dramatically from sales 2.0 to sales 3.0. Now, what was sales 2.0? Very simple. 2.0 was all about moving everything online. It's about cloud computing. Everything is available. All the customer data is online. That's 2.0. What is 3.0? See, technology is something that comes from the human brain. And when technology is created, the human brain changes. And that's the evolutionary cycle that we're living with. And we need to be mindful that we are creating that change. And we have a say in that change. We have a say in what we can adapt and what we should adapt and what we shouldn't adapt. So the leaders in technology, in my view, is Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, Salesforce, and SAP. And over the past six months, something really amazing happened. They all seem to com conspire around the same message. And the same message is, when you look at Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos says, all the major tech companies will do this. We are on the edge of a golden era. It's about artificial intelligence. So Jeff Bezos is betting the shop and the shop is doing $100 billion worth of business without salespeople, with zero salespeople. It's mostly automated. And artificial intelligence guides the buyer to the buy button. And artificial intelligence can suggest books. It uh, can remind you that you need to buy more shampoo, right? And uh, it predicts the future of their business. At IBM, the CEO says, there's no doubt in my mind that cognitive computing will impact every decision in five years. What is cognitive computing? They gave it a new name for Watson. So Watson is transforming the medical profession right now, where all the medical information of all the diseases and all the cures and all the diagnostic tools that they have, 
go in one computer, and the more they feed into the machine, the smarter the machine becomes. So a doctor in West Africa can type in, I see those symptoms, what is the diagnosis, what's the prognosis, what is the prescription, and the doctor in West Africa gets exactly the same information that a doctor at the Mayo Clinic has to come up with a better diagnosis, come up with better treatment. So the world is improving by cognitive computing, by machine learning. Look at uh, Satya Nadella. The core capability of being able to create value comes from being able to do machine learning and AI at scale. It's really what this next wave of technology innovation is all about. So he talks about artificial intelligence. And by the way, Amazon has 600 people working on artificial intelligence. Microsoft has, has hundreds, and uh, Oracle has hundreds, and Salesforce.com has about 175 people. Mark Hertz says, customized decision-making across the board, <laughs> using analytics to empower frontline sales staff to service their customers in the moment, rather than when it's convenient for somebody to get back to them. So Mark talks about in the moment. Amazon transacts in the moment. The future of selling is about transacting in the moment. And artificial intelligence is the tool to get us there. So what I'm getting at, and Mark Benioff, of course, there are a lot of new technology in the fourth industrial revolution. He gives us a, a more you know, important name, the fourth industrial revolution. Virtual re reality, augmented reality, we are at an incredible edge. And so with Parker Harris at Dreamforce, they introduced Einstein. Bill McDermott talked about machine learning. It will fundamentally change the enterprise. It will help salespeople predict which opportunities will close. So uh, when I was at Sapphire in Orlando, I was totally floored by the digital boardroom. Um, it provides total transparency to board members, executives, decision makers, with a comprehensive live view of business performance across an entire front and back office of a company. So what Sales 3.0 is doing, that all the data across the enterprise will become available as a decision-making support system that's visualized. And in the future, it will be a tool that drives salespeople and decides what markets you need to call on, what talking points you need to share. They give you the probability of what the sale could be. So think about that technology. The same technology is operating in a self-driving car. In Pittsburgh, Uber is testing self-driving cars. So you can't talk to anybody anymore. You just get where you want to go. And I got a demonstration in San Francisco a couple of months ago by Curious.io, and uh, they have created a virtual sales playbook. And essentially, the CEO says artificial intelligence creates instant vi visibility in the cognitive flow of each conversation that sales reps conduct with their customers. So what, what are you doing, actually? You sit in front of a screen, and you have a conversation with the customer, and the conversation appears where the speech gets translated into text on the screen, and there's sort of a whisper function where the machine tells you what to say next, what ideas to share. And over two weeks, that machine can actually learn from all the conversations that all salespeople have and filter out the A players from the B players and then feed the A player conversation flow to the B player, improving everybody. So sales 3.0 is technology advising salespeople who to call on, what to say, how to execute, and the machine is going to tell you, here's the value strategy for your customer. 
the machine is going to tell you there's a closing probability of 72%. And the machine is going to tell you, get moving, you're 24% behind your goal. <laughs> so it's not just machine-driven learning, it's also machine-driven management. And that's the scary part. See, the thing is, I'm going back to the zeitgeist. Think about leadership. Every group wants a leader. Every group wants to first elect a leader that's good for them, that represents their values, a leader that supports them. And the moment a leader is elected, that desire and hope translates into fear because they're going to worry if Dave is the leader. What is he going to do to me? <laughs> right? So there's always fear. So we, we need to, as leaders, transform their fear, the, that fear and remind people that we are here to do our jobs. We import problems, we fix problems, we export problems, and we get solutions back. So the purpose of leadership is to set those boundaries and remind the followers, this is the job we have to do. We need to focus on what we can do, not what we want to control and don't even need to control. So we need to become more realistic about everything that's imported into that task that everybody has and one of them is technology. We need to integrate that. And a lot of people fear technology. A lot of people want to stay behind and say, hey, I don't want to change. I don't want to jump on that bus because I worry how this is going to affect me. So Sales 3.0 is a world where technology applies artificial intelligence to advance the sales process in real time. It advises the sales team on the best steps. It will accelerate sales results activate the full potential of your business. So that's the new reality that I see on the technology side. But there's another side. This is not a vacuum. This is a whole system. And technology is getting better. There's no doubt in my mind. The big question is, how do people get better? Because we lose a lot of people. We lose a lot of people to unemployment. We lose a lot of people to drugs, to self-medication. And there's something systemically wrong in our system that I clearly see, which is as we become better at technological functioning, we get worse with psychological functioning. And we as leaders, what we need to restore is optimal psychological functioning, so that people are happy, so that people are more productive. So it is the mindset that you need to look at as a sales leader. And to help you frame this in a context, um, you know, th those are some of the leaders that I've interviewed, and, and you may recognize some of the faces. Uh, five of those people are uh, billionaires, and I, I call them the peak performance mindset performers. And uh, I won't go into the details, on, but that, that's a, a totally different story. But the question is, where does the mindset fit into the process for driving sales performance? And here's my graph. There are two areas you want to look at, business success and personal success. When it comes to business success, you want to align people, process, and technology. You want to integrate the technology in people's minds and hearts so that people adopt the technology. But on the professional success side, we need to realize that success is all about building the right mindset, creating the right skill set, and adopting the right tool set. So we need to lead with a culture that embraces the mindset. So an organization needs to be mindful that the object is helping people win, helping customers win. 
And it is all about the value system of the company. It's all about the belief system of the leader. So if you have a leader with a faulty belief system, the company is not going to go very far. To me, mindset development is the next frontier in sales development. And research shows that the mindset is like an operating system that governs a lot of critical functions that, and by the way, you can get those slides, so you don't have to write down every bullet point, but the gist of it is that if you want to ch change the organization in a positive way, you want to start with the mindset. So I'm going to share 10 questions with you, and uh, you're going to ask yourself, do I have the mindset of a successful leader? And the first question is, do you have a growth mindset? And Dr. Carol Dweck wrote a book, The Mindset, in uh, 2008. The book is 10 years old, and she essentially said that the only thing that separates people who succeed from those who don't is whether or not they have a growth mindset. I happen to agree with that, but it's not the full story. It's only part of the story. A growth mindset means that there are unlimited possibilities and acting on those possibilities and also embracing the fact that we can learn new things, we can change behavior, we can change belief systems, we can do better. What the book doesn't address is how. It addresses it to a certain extent. Then you have uh, Daniel Goleman who came up with the idea of uh, emotional intelligence. And that's uh, a, a mouthful. It's uh, heavily embraced by a lot of people. And he says, if you don't have self-awareness, if you're not able to manage your distressing emotions, if you can't have empathy and have effective relationships, then no matter how smart you are, you're not going to go very far. Does that make sense? Does everybody agree with that? OK. So Anthony Honorino, where are you? Is he here? Well, he came up with this last night, and I thought I'd weave it into the presentation. He says, IQ plus EQ plus TQ equals success. IQ is intelligence quotient, emotional intelligence, and also technology intelligence. A lot of salespeople don't want to step up to that. And we, we need, as leaders, we need to tell them that technology is a tool it goes with your mindset, and you want to embrace the technology that helps you advance as a professional. Secondly, are you aware of how you created your mindset? If you want to fix your mindset and improve it, you want to know what are the moving parts? Where do you start? And to me, it's actually quite simple. It's not rocket science. The mindset foundation is from red to green. Red is the implanted mindset. That's what your parents implant in you. All the attitudes, belief systems that you see from your parents, they implant it in your mind. It's not easy to let go, but the way to look at it is like a garden where you can make a decision to water the flowers and you can make a decision to stop watering the weeds. So we can change the mindset from the bottom up. The imprinted mindset is when you meet people that impress you. They have habits or behaviors that you, you want to learn from, you want to adopt. You want to learn from people who are persistent, who have a can-do attitude. So you want to integrate that. And those are the coaches and teachers that help you along the way. And then you have the inspired mindset. And that, to me, is the crown jewel of humanity, where everybody is born with some talents. And it's your job to find out what is your talent and to nurture it and grow it. And have the courage to be you. Next question, do you create a culture that provides a high ratio of positive to negative feedback? A lot of cultures are punitive, where you have an authoritarian regime and they don't support their people. So 
psychologist uh, Marshall Lozada found that among high-performing teams, the ratio of positive to negative feedback is 5.6 to 1. Now, that's an article in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, everybody accepts that. The question is, how do you do that? How do you give positive feedback? Because a lot of the leaders say, if I'm too positive, you know, then we remove the fear and then I won't perform as well. So we need to understand that the psychology behind it, salespeople, and there was an article in the Harvard Business Review in 1956 by, and it was the first article I have ever read in Harvard Business Review when I came to this country, and I thought, this is amazing. It was Dr. Herb Greenberg who said that salespeople need two qualities. One is empathy, and the other one is the ego drive. And empathy is the ability to feel like the customer is feeling and understanding the emotional side of the customer and responding to that intelligently. And the other one is to want that sale to be hungry and walk away with the clothes. So salespeople who were too empathetic and had too much empathy, they couldn't get the order. And salespeople who had too much ego drive, they were too aggressive and they got kicked out or got a canceled order the next day. So we need to understand those psychological drives. So as a sales leader, you want to be Attila the Hun and say, we need to make our numbers and stand up for that. But at the other, on the other side, we need, to under, we need to say, hey, I totally understand your difficulty and I want to help you win. So understand, cold calling is hard. Let's work out new ways to make it easier for everybody. So that is the, the, the challenge we have because we tend to adopt new ideas and then the pendulum swings too far in the opposite direction. Four, do you make it your business to learn about your followers' dreams and goals? And that's another thing that so many sales organizations, they have a, a leaderboard and they talk about, you know, this is what we want to achieve and they forget to talk about what people want to achieve. Steve, what is your goal? Make sales. Make sales. What is your dream for yourself? What do you want to do? Be a sales leader. Be a sales leader. Awesome. So as a sales leader, what do you think you're going to get for, from being a good sales leader for a long period of time? What do you get out of this? Opportunity. Money. Money. Uh, freedom. Freedom. What do you do with the money? Uh, support my family. Support your family. So my suggestion is when you go back, create a, have a conversation with salespeople. What are your dreams? What do you want? The what is the first thing. He wants to support his family. Why do you want to support your family? Or why do you want to get a bigger car? Why do you want to get a bigger house? The bigger the why, the bigger the try, the easier the how. So we need to leverage the psychology, the mindset psychology of salespeople to get what you want because you help them get what they want. That's what Sig Ziglar said a long time ago. So we, we have worked with the organizations. We have created the wall of dreams next to the leaderboard, and then the conversation changes all of a sudden from the company numbers to what people want. And then they help each other win. Five, do you know how to awaken the inner CEO? And there are two states. One is the mindless state, and the other one is the mindful state. The mindless state is that we are in automatic mode. We go, 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 go. We never disconnect. And in the age of connection, we need to make a conscious decision to disconnect because our ability to sell hinges on the ability to be in the present moment. We want to be in the here and now and not in the ugly past and not in the worrisome future. So we need to shift our state from doing to being. 
We are human beings, not human doings. So we need to manage our mind and clean out our mindset. And the inner CEO is the one that can do it. And this is a higher level thinking. And when you think about the movie Sullenberger and you see the reality behind that decision to ditch the plane in the Hudson River and save 155 lives, it's because his inner CEO was at the control. Somebody else would have said, oh my God, two engines are out, we're doomed. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, we have somebody here who uh, has written a book about um, the inner critic. Um, introduce yourself. My Chris Salem. Is, uh, oh, thanks. My name is Chris Salem. I just uh, recently published a book that came out about a year and a half called Master Your Inner Critic and Solve Your Cause of Great Prosperity. And it really touches everything that you see in this day. It's really about learning to master your inner critic. You have a positive and negative side. And it's about resolving your responsibilities and not your experience. Too many of us are managing our lives in the effect of the negative symptoms. To live in solution, you have to resolve the problem. Thank you, Chris. Give me a hand. So, do you know how to manage your thoughts and your emotions in difficult situations at work? And here's a statistic that really floored me, which is that we experience 60,000 thoughts a day. And 80% of those thoughts are negative. And that's why Chris wrote this book. And negative thoughts and feelings are the biggest barriers to sales productivity. And positive thinking is not enough. We need to have a better internal dialogue, and we can master that internal dialogue by activating our inner CEO. <coughs> and to flourish both physically and emotionally, we need a ratio of better than three to one between negative thoughts and experiences and feelings and positive thoughts. So we need more positive thoughts. We need to create more positive experiences. And one of the tools is mindfulness, to have a mindfulness break and not rush from one activity to another, from one meeting to the next, without a mindset reset. And you can do this just by breathing. Take three deep breaths and don't think of anything else but breathing. Focus on the here and now. Focus on the present moment before you step into the next moment. It's very powerful. It's very simple. It takes less than three minutes. Do you know what drives peak performance? And uh, the book by Sean Arker, Before Happiness, says that people with a happy mindset, they have 23% more energy, they're 31% more productive, they're 300% more creative. And the best part is, which is not on that slide, it's also in this book, their cell, 38% more, just by creating happy feelings for themselves. But what's not to like? So put happiness on your to-do list every day. And happiness com comes, actually comes from loving yourself. So write down, just for yourself, Right now, write down a number on a scale of 1 to 10. And put down in that number to the degree to which you love yourself. Are you a 10, which is amazing? Are you a 3, a 5, a 6, a 7? Write down that number. Don't share it with anybody else. Just write it down. So I just want to see a show of hands. How many tens do we have? So why are there so few tens? What's wrong with that picture? I want everybody to be a 10. Why are you not a 10? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying I know what you wrote, but I have a hunch 
because you feel you don't deserve it. And people who don't write down 10, they have a hard time accepting compliments because they don't love themselves. So my suggestion to you all is, and this sounds totally crazy, but try it. Every time you get up in the morning, the first thing you do, you tell yourself, I love you. Try it. Try it for a week. And I guarantee you, by the end of the week, you're going to sleep better, you have better thoughts, you're going to feel better, you have more energy, and you feel more alive. I see some skeptical faces. <laughs> this is not BS. That's basic psychology. Because the human body thrives on nurturing. So we need to be the warrior, but we also need to be the lover. We need to fight like crazy, but we also need to love. We need both. It's empathy, ego drive. If you want to get better, you got to get better at fighting. You got to get better at loving. Um, Dr. Becca Levy said people with a positive mindset live on average seven and a half years longer. So if you want to have a longer life, you have a happy mindset. You actually decide, consciously or unconsciously, how long you're going to live. Eight, do you know what drives peak performance behavior? A lot of people think they do. Um, and here's a list, and you can see the bullets. Um, when I, I got to race through a little bit. But one of the things that I find wrong with all sales compensation systems is they reward people for behavior, and it doesn't work. You cannot change behavior unless you change the belief system. Behavior is like the tip of the iceberg, and the belief system is what bubbles up to the top of the iceberg. So you want to challenge your belief system if somebody says, I don't want to make that many cold calls. That's a behavior. So your challenge is, why? What do you believe? How is that going to help you? How is this going to help the company? How is this going to help the customers that need our services? So what's the underlying belief system? And then people say, well, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be in, in position to them. But can you reframe that? Is there a better way of thinking about this? So if you change the belief system, you change the performance, because then the behavior changes automatically. So there's a whole science behind that as well. Uh, Bill McDermott, good friend of mine, has written a wonderful book, Win a Stream. And he says, success means hustling with a will to win. And he has been an excellent salesman. He's, uh, the, I recommend the book highly to everybody. If you're in sales, want to be a better sales leader, read that book. And there's a story where he transformed Puerto Rico from the worst territory to the best in uh, 12 months. And uh, Richard Brans Branson said, I set apparently unachievable challenges and learn how to rise above them. And I've been working with sales teams on mindset management and challenged a lot of salespeople to double their goals, to triple their goals. What needs to happen if you do 300% more? And why are you thinking in limits? And there's a science to adopting a no limit mindset. And there's a, a story from, I mean, uh, Lou Hollander is, uh, is a, an extraordinary example. At age 82, he ran an Ironman race in 16 hours and 45 minutes. And he says, life is like a bank account. Um, and it's your mindset that determines how rich you're going to be. So he says, I want to live 120. And I know he's going to, he's going to do it. Uh, Sarah Blakely, um, she grew up in a situation when it was, she was 16 years old. Her best friend died in a car crash. Her parents got divorced. And she got that set of tapes from Dr. Wayne Dyer how to be a no-limit person. 
And she listened to those tapes like 400 times until she knew it verbatim. And she adopted that no limit mindset to her business. And today she's 44 and she's worth $1.1 billion. Keith Crack from the CEO of DocuSign, he talks about escape velocity. So you need to have a mindset where you can ex escape the gravitational pull of mediocrity. Mediocrity is a powerful seduction. It feels safe. We know it. But we need to break through. We need to break away from that. Um, then we have Steve Jobs. He says, were you led to believe that you must live inside the box called life? And there's a video which I can't play because I'm running out of time. But essentially, Steve said, once I realized that all the rules that governed life were made up by other people, I decided to make up my own rules. So step out of that box that life has been designed to keep you fenced in or boxed in. Mindfulness, I talked about that. Uh, 10, do you engage in meaningful developmental conversations with your followers? People are not so excited about money than they're excited about meaning. People want to engage in meaningful work. And people are craving for a meaningful conversation with their sales leader. And when you can add meaning to work, you're going to get a much higher level of performance out of everybody. So I want you to transform your life, create your peak performance mindset, um, embrace technology, become aware that it's the mindset that changes the skill set, changes the, that helps people embrace the tool set they're, that they're getting. And you get so much higher performance. So look how coal transforms into a diamond, how a grain of sand transforms into a pearl, how a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. And to me, transformation is the essence of life. And I want you to honor your life by transforming into a peak performer. Thank you very much.